Então, em primeiro lugar, temos a satisfação de chamar o Geoffrey Builder, que é uh, do CrossRef, mas vai é, situar para nós, é, vamos chamar um framework, um, um marco conceitual de todos os aspectos de interoperabilidade. Geoffrey, por favor. Thank you, Abel. Um, so, uh, as uh, you've been told, my name is Jeffrey Builder, and um, I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at Crossref. And um, that term is kind of a mouthful, so when people ask me what I do, I generally say new stuff. Um, and that's basically what I do. Now, uh, first, I, I want to thank Abel, everybody, for inviting me here uh, to, to celebrate Cielo's birthday. Um, it's just an amazing coincidence that it happens to coincide with a sort of celebration we're having at Crossref, which is that as of yesterday, uh, we've actually uh, registered 100 million uh, DOIs. That's 100 million research outputs that have been assigned persistent identifiers and metadata and things like that. And um, this all has a lot to do with the stuff that I'm going to talk about today, uh, which is um, interoperability. Uh, visibility and credibility. Now, when I was asked to do the opening session for this, Abel said, look, could you try and sort of give an overview, something that ties together a lot of the things that we've been talking about over the past few days, um, and that sort of lays a framework um, for, the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the other speakers here who are going to be talking about parts of um, the scholarly ecosystem uh, that affect uh, these, these things, interoperability, visibility, and credibility. And, um, and the truth is that this is like one of my favorite things to do. I love, I, I get invited to lots of places to uh, sort of generalize and, and often actually to complain and to insult the people who have invited me. Um, and so I, I really thought this was a great opportunity to think about these, these three sort of terms and how they are intertwined and how um, and how they've been sort of subtopics throughout almost everything that we've talked about um, uh, in, over the past few days. Um, but, but this excitement was also tempered by a realization that I, I personally have a tendency to go over time in talks, and in particular we've had a little bit of a problem with that. So I was trying to figure out how to do this succinctly. And I, so I was trying to think of all the threads and what are the, what are the similarities and what are the things. And finally, in the interest of time, I concluded that um, the, the thing is that all of these things end in ability, right? So now we can go home. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> if you thought you were going to get away that easily, you've got another thing coming. But um, in order to sort of uh, lighten the mood, uh, now that you know you're stuck here for a very long time, um, uh, when we talk about interoperability, I thought that we'd start by playing a game. Uh, a game uh, that, that sort of illustrates something that we probably would have never thought about as uh, being uh, interoperable. So um, I'm going to show you this picture, and I'm going to ask people, what is that? It's an article. Isn't that terrifying that you can tell? <laughs> that you can tell that that's a scholarly article and that you can't read it? Do you ever remember learning how to do this? It's kind of a weird thing that we can do this. It's even weirder uh, that we can do things like identify bits of it. What's that? Yeah, that's all right. And uh, let's see, what's, um, how is this going to advance? Come on, what's that? And, and, and the little line below that? Affiliations. Affiliations. That's terrifying. How do we know that? And, uh, and what's that? All right. So now just think about that. Now here I'm going to ask you a few other questions. What's the topic? Is it, is it humanities, social sciences, sciences? Anybody know? Now, that's interoperable, right? The fact that we have a common structure at such a high level that tells us immediately that this is a scholarly article, and yet we have no idea. Is this the social sciences, sciences, or the humanities? These things are ubiquitous. 
I'm going to ask you another question. This one's a little unfair because you can probably guess, but what language is it in? It's probably English, right? But you can't really tell, and if this had been in another language, it would have looked just the same. And so there's another level of interoperability here. This structure, something we barely think about at all at any given time, is something that's embedded in our brains. We recognize it immediately, and it helps us identify this as content that is, that is targeted towards us and our interests and the way that we consume information. And all of these things that you were able to identify are infrastructure, are bits that allow you to navigate and use that content more efficiently than other content that's out there that often does not have these kinds of conventions. Um, and, that, and, 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 and so these conventions are very important. We'll just move on a little bit here. And obviously, right, yes, it's an article. And it happens to be in the social sciences. And I swear I picked this randomly when I first put this demo together. Um, but you can do this for so many articles. And you can do it for more things as well. So, you know, what's that? References, right, fine. And uh, so, and what's this? Acknowledgments. <laughs> I still can't get over the fact that we just know this stuff. Now, the thing, the reason that I bring this up is because we, we, we're so focused on the electronic, and we're so focused on these things, and we talk about getting rid of the PDF and how we want to move into the electronic world and how important this is, but there's a big thing here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this next slide. That's something that, um, I mean, there, we could go on identifying pieces of these things forever, but this is a website. Can you tell if it's academic or not? Right? And it is. And um, here's another one. Can you tell? So think about this for a little bit. Think about all that structure, all that information, all that, all those heuristic cues that tell you something about the content that you're looking at that have been stripped away in the move from print to electronic. Right? Think of the interoperability elements that might have been stripped away in doing that. This is one of the things that we really have to be concerned about in the future, and of course this is not academic, it's anything but academic. So I would maintain that at the moment we have very few replacements for these kinds of heuristics. And kind of self-servingly, I will admit, I'll say that there are some that may be emerging. So for instance, if we look at these two things, we recognize these, Two things now as things that appear on content that's intended for a scholarly audience, right? And, and, but there's, we can't recognize them in the same immediate way that we can some of those other things. When we see DOIs, when we see ORCIDs, this tells us something, but we don't have the richness of apparatus of, of, of tools that we can use to identify uh, content and to make them interoperate. But mind you, these are critical interoperation tools. This, these tools mean that you can have one journal from one publisher cite another journal from another publisher, and it doesn't matter if that journal changes hands, changes platforms, moves, does anything. Those citations are going to continue to work in a way that normal links do not. And similarly, we're in an industry where it is vital that we know precisely who said something and who to, um, you know, who provided evidence and who to give credit to, and therefore name collisions, which are something that are probably a minor annoyance in a lot of other kinds of publications, are a critical thing here. And so creating contributor identifiers has been something that's been at the top of our list. These are critical elements of interoperability. So the next thing that I need to talk about is a little bit is visibility. And I'm going to do two things. The first thing is I'm going to talk about sort of a phraseology that I think we've adopted and that at least personally kind of repulses me. And that is that we often use the term disseminate when we talk about making things visible in the scholarly world. And one of the problems with disseminate is that it's a very sort of one-sided thing. I want to spread this stuff around. It doesn't have any sort of reciprocity or anything like this involved in it as opposed to the term communicate, which does give you the sense that at least this is at, at the very least a two-way street. And so one of the things that I'd say is that when we are talking about things and we talk about dissemination, other terms like that, you know, just making it visible, it's not enough to make it visible 
It's something that needs to be engaged with. It's something where you need to be able to go back and forth. So when we create technologies, it's not enough to broadcast it in neon lights. If nobody can respond to it and interact with it and do things with it, that's a problem, right? The other thing that I want to talk about is a little bit, when we talk about visibility, we still tend to think of users, human beings, sitting in front of screens doing things. And increasingly, this is not the case. This is not what we're dealing with. What we're dealing with is robots. Things that are taking this content and harvesting it and looking at it and comparing it. And so whatever tools that we do use to make things visible, we have to make them as machine actionable as possible as well. And this is very important, just as to give you a sense of the scale of what we're talking about. Crossref, we have an API, um, which is an application programmer's interface. And it's used um, by, uh, by many, many people, many services, things like EasyBib and Zenodo and a bunch of services like digital, uh, digital Science and stuff use us. And just last month, just last month, um, <laughs> we had almost 240 million queries of this API. This information, the metadata associated with DOIs is going all over the place and it's turning around and does this matter? Yes, it matters because what's happening to this is we are having lots of different publishers. Last count, we have 11,000 members depositing metadata into Crossref, which then gets distributed to third parties, including publishers all over the world, which just then gets turned into citations and references and things like that in papers, which then go back to publishers. So there's this virtuous circle of metadata where the publishers are submitting it, it's going into the system, researchers are using it, they're using it to cite content and to link to content in more authoritative ways, and this keeps going round and round, and I'm sorry about the <coughs> PowerPoint conversion problems there. And so then this brings us to the final thing, credibility, which of course is about trust. And it's useful when you're talking about credibility and trust to at least have a definition that you're working with. And the one that I like to work with is this by Phil Windley, which is a firm belief in the veracity, good faith, honesty of another party with respect to a transaction that involves some risk. The important thing here is the risk part, right? Because the risk, at the very least, of a researcher engaging co with content that is not trustworthy, the very least, they're wasting their very valuable time but it could be a lot worse than that in our industry. And this is why credibility, credibility which is a gigantic topic with the media, has all, you know, with the media now, the mainstream media, or as Jan would call it, the mainstream media, um, this, is, this is our bread and butter. This is what we should be focusing on. This is exactly the kind of stuff that we have to be paying attention to. And one of the things that we do as researchers when we're trying to, when we're dealing with unfamiliar content, is that we start looking at provenance information to try and determine what it is, if there's something in the content, that what, why we should trust it, right? So we look at an article and we see what other articles refer to it. What articles does it refer to? Does it include data? Does it include software? Does it link to um, protocols? Does it do all of the things that you would expect a responsible publication to do? And increasingly, we're having to make this data available in machine-readable form so that machines and tools can also make decisions about content. If you have content that's just out there and it doesn't have metadata, if it has no provenance information, that's a red signal to people. We have to, this is important. And increasingly, it's not just these sort of things sitting around the side, but we also have multiple versions of things. As the publication process becomes more fluid, as preprints come out there and then get revised and edited, and, and as we have open peer review processes, we're going to have to be able to link all of these things together to make sure that people understand what the provenance of the article is. And then, of course, what's really important in this context is also translation, right, where we have translated versions of articles that are also relevant. And at the moment, this is a, it, it's way harder to link these things than it should be. But this is increasingly important for us to understand and to be able to develop heuristics for determining whether or not this content is credible. And all of this is based on things that are going to be talked about by some of the other panelists, identifiers for content, for contributors, for organizations, for funders, for grants, for licenses. This is the stuff that ties us together. And it sounds incredibly boring, but it's so vital. When you talk about identifiers, you tend to think, well, maybe it's about you know, supply chain management or something. In our context, identifiers are about trust and credit. 
And so I am actually wrapping up, and I see that things have turned red over here and ominous. We've heard this phrase, the version of record. And then more recently, we've heard people talking about the record of versions. And this is a very important concept, again, because we are going to have multiple versions of the same content out there, and we have to understand how they're related to them. And so what I think also we need, though, is to understand the record of the version. That is, when you are looking at a version, you need to understand what's been done to it, how it's related to other content, how it's related to other versions, how it's related to translations. Ultimately, we're replacing the concept of the version of record with a record of versions, and each version with a record of what's been done to it. These are the things that are going to help people uh, uh, assess the credibility of content this is the new infrastructure that we're building. The stuff that we took for granted here isn't going to look like this anymore. It's going to look like metadata. And so this infrastructure, we need to make sure that this provenance infrastructure is preserved because information about the research process is so important. We need to make sure that this information, this meta information about the research process is, and I'm trying to advance the slide, as open as the content itself. Because if the infrastructure that controls this metadata about the process is enclosed, we're going to be in a far worse position than we were when the content itself was closed. So thank you. That is the real end. And I think I only want a few seconds. Left. Muito obrigado ao Jeffrey por essa visão do tema desse painel.